going to be making our way through Luke chapter 20 verses 1 through 8 and let's do what we always do before we dive into those verses. Let's back up and review what we talked about last week so that we are keeping everything, what church? In its proper context. Beautiful, beautiful. Now last week we made our way through Luke 19 verses 41 through 48. And it's in the part, it's, we're in the part of the story where Jesus is, is coming into Jerusalem for the last time. This is, this is it. He's heading into Jerusalem for the last time before he is murdered. And as he's heading in, there are thousands of Jews surrounding him. They are throwing their cloaks before him. And as he is arriving, we, we know this is the week of Passover. So there would be Jews coming from all over making this pilgrimage. There were so many, it, it's been claimed there would be millions of Jews that would come to Jerusalem. So many that they could not stay in the city. So they would put tents up along the road leading into it. So, so here's Jesus, massive crowd following him in. And now there's a massive crowd coming out to greet him. And he's on this colt. There's jackets everywhere. There's palm leaves everywhere. People are celebrating. But not... Jesus, Jesus begins sobbing. And we said last week, this, this sob isn't just a tear running down a cheek. No, he is crushed. His shoulders are going up and down because he is just broken at this moment. Everyone's cheering. And Jesus is sobbing. Why? Because he knows the majority of Jews that are celebrating him are not believers. He knows that this celebration is not a true celebration because they're welcoming him in as this warrior king who's going to overthrow the Roman Empire. They do not see him in the way in which the Bible prophesies. The suffering servant who is coming to bear the wrath of God for all those whose faith is placed in him. He's crushed at this church. They should have seen this coming. But because of false teaching... The religious leaders had corrupted the word. And the so-called believers, they weren't diving into it for themselves. They were just trusting what the teachers were saying. They bought in to the false message that was being presented. So what does Jesus do? Jesus prophesies to the Jewish people. He tells them that there's a time that's coming that is going to destroy them. Now he's speaking of four decades into the future when the Roman Empire, by way of God, raising them up, will come and destroy Jerusalem, tear down the temple, kill the women, men, children, babies. It didn't matter. For the wrath of God was coming upon them, for they had rejected the Savior. And it was going to be brutal, church. But that's the price that is paid when you reject the Savior. That is the price you pay when you sit under false teaching. And you need not feel sorry for those who sit under false teaching, for it is what they deserve.
They don't want the truth. They want their ears tickled. So here Jesus speaks of this prophecy. And he arrives into Jerusalem. Again, crowd swarming him. And we know that he goes to the temple. And it's in the courtyard of the temple, the Gentile courtyard, where he steps in and he looks around. And it's awful. For the people, the religious leaders, had turned the house of God into a den of thieves. For the Jewish people would bring, many of them would bring their own animals to be sacrificed. But what the religious leaders would do, they would inspect the animal, and even if it was perfect for the sacrifice, they would tell them, no, 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 this animal is blemished. You must go purchase one of our animals at a higher rate. And then you had all the foreigners coming in. They would have a different currency. But the only currency that would be accepted at the temple when you paid the temple tax would be the coins of Jerusalem. So they would have to exchange their money at a 12.5% exchange rate. So Jesus sees this. And it's getting late in the day, so we know that he goes back home with the disciples, well, the home that he's staying at in the town of Bethany, which is probably about two miles away. And then the very next day, Jesus returns, and he goes to the temple, and he clears it out. And he clears it out in the manliest way possible, literally grabbing a hold of people and slinging them out. Jesus would have been outnumbered, they would have been coming at him in all directions, but they could not touch this man when he was angry. And it was a righteous anger. By the end of it, people were starting to back away, for they knew that Jesus meant business. And then what does he do? After he manhandles everyone in there, he begins to preach the word, to tell them the good news. Again, you see the compassion of our Lord and Savior. Jesus, still in Jerusalem. Let's dive in. Luke 20, verse 1. One day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple... And preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders came up. Now, this may have been a Wednesday, the day after he removed the cheating merchants and the false teachers from the courtyard, which means what? Church, we're just hours away from him being nailed to that tree. And this is how Jesus was going to spend his last living hours. Preaching the good news, teaching the gospel. Now, we don't need to ask ourselves, why is he doing this, do we? He's doing this because it's by far the most important truth that one can ever hear. But before we understand what the good news is, we must first grasp the bad news the bad news is the Jewish people had the law of God. And because of false teaching, they were taught that to enter into the kingdom of heaven, you must follow these laws. So they're being taught that they can work their way into heaven, church. But that's not what Jesus taught. That's not what the word teaches. What the word teaches is that God deserves perfection. God deserves for his laws to be followed perfectly. But guess what, oh man? You can't do it. 
And because you cannot do it, you know what that makes you? A sinner. A wretch. A heathen. But because of the false teachers and their false teaching, this is what the Jewish people believed. But what is it that the word tells us? That no one can enter into the kingdom by following the law. This is why it's bad news. We can't do it perfectly. We are so wicked that even if we do not commit a sinful action, the very thought alone separates us from the Holy Father. You don't commit it, you think it, therefore you have rebelled against God. That's our wickedness. And yet, this is laid out all through the Old Testament because that's all the Jewish people would have had during that time. And yet, because of false teaching, they held to that. Notice I keep saying that over and over again. There's a reason. But here's the good news, church. The God-man, the second person in the Holy Trinity, came down in human form, and fulfilled the law perfectly, becoming the perfect sacrifice. And every sinner, listen, every sinner, I don't care what sin you have committed, there is no sin that the blood of Christ hasn't covered. This is so important, church. You may be sitting there thinking, yes, but you don't know what I've done. Does it matter? God knows what you did. And for you to sit there and say that Christ going to the cross doesn't cover your sin, what's well, covering your sin of arrogance? For those whose faith is in Christ, know that you are no longer guilty before God. No, no, no. You have been clothed in his righteousness. Christ bore the believer's sins on the cross and he received the wrath that we deserve, believers. That's the good news. The believer did absolutely nothing for it, but reaps the benefits of the amazing, gracious, and merciful work of Jesus. This is what Jesus is teaching in his last hours. Surrounded by thousands. And this is how he spends his last moments. And in doing so, what does he do? He catches the attention of the chief priest, the scribes, and the elders. They see Jesus, people hanging on his every word, and begin to approach him. Now the chief priest, this would include the reigning high priest, that being Caiaphas, and the former high priest, Annas. It would have also included the captain of the temple, the high priest's assistant. Then you have the scribes, who were mostly made up of the Pharisaic theologians who would interpret the law and teach. And then the elders. So here they are. Approaching Jesus. And the Greek translation is a bit more forceful. They're coming to interrupt him. To interrogate him. They wanted this to stop. Why? Because the more Jesus teaches, the more they are being exposed. Exposed. 
They were being exposed. They were being called out as the false teachers that they were. He's calling them out and he's pointing the people to the truth, which is himself. So what's happening to these religious leaders the more Jesus speaks? They feel as if their power is being removed from them. That their income will start to decrease. But they couldn't seize him there or else they would have had a riot on their hands. Remember, this is still the time where people are still praising Jesus. So look at verse 2. They said to him, now they would have walked up, Jesus would have stopped preaching, and it would have been silent. So everyone's going to hear this. Verse 2, it says, And said to him, Tell us by what authority you do these things, or who it is that gave you this authority. Why this question? I mean, he's answered this in the past. He's told them before that his authority is from God. Now, who do they believe that his authority is from? They've said it themselves. Satan. It's interesting, isn't it? Here Jesus is, who's never studied underneath a rabbi like the other Jewish religious leaders. So they didn't officially recognize him as a rabbi. But if he answers, if he answers this question, and he says that his authority comes from himself, do you know what they could do? They could arrest him for blasphemy. And they would have witnesses, thousands of witnesses hearing this. Or, if he answered that his authority comes from God, they could also arrest him for blasphemy. Why? Again, we have to understand, Jesus never studied underneath an official rabbi. The, the religious leaders have already made the claim that Jesus' miracles come by way of Satan. So whichever answer he gives, they're thinking they got him. You can see these brilliant minds, their smugness as they approach. They finally have this man. They're finally going to do away with Jesus once and for all. He cannot get out of this one. But Jesus, verse 3, answers them. I also will ask you a question. Oh, man. Now, look, this was common during this time. For one can answer a question with another question, making the question here go deeper in what it is that they are asking. But he also does something else by doing this. Jesus is about to take the attention off of himself, and he's going to direct their focus to John the Baptist. And he does this in a form of a brilliant question. Jesus, not only can he clear out the temples by himself, but he stumps the most prideful, brilliant men. Verse 4. Let's read 3 and 4 together. He answered them, I also will ask you a question. Now tell me. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Oh, man. Now who's trapped? They went from thinking, that being the religious leaders, that they're winning to in a split second thinking, oh, man. Here we are in front of all these people who respect us, who fear us, and now we're caught.
was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Why was, why did Jesus ask this question? Well, one, it's brilliant because he's going to expose their hypocrisy. Again, because they knew, they heard Jesus make the claim where his authority comes from. They've heard that. They knew the answer. But also, these religious leaders, they weren't asking Jesus that question to gather information. They were trying to lure him in so that they could arrest him. Now, there's something else that we need to also understand about this period in time. John the Baptist was seen as a rock star. The people saw John as the prophet. Now, John's dead, but they believed John in what he said. To a certain extent. Now look at verse 5. And they discussed it with one another. So, so again, you can picture the religious leader standing there. Jesus right here. They ask him a question. He then asks them a question. And now the people are all staring at the religious leaders. And the religious leaders are gathering together. Surely these gifted theologians had an answer to this Simple question. I mean, how can Jesus, a man with no official rabbinical training, compete with the massive brains of the intelligentsia of Jerusalem? And yet what happens? These brilliant scholars are just staring at each other with their mouths hanging open. They've become mouth breathers in a matter of moments. You can see them staring at the crowd, then at Jesus, then they look at each other, crowd, Jesus, each other, crowd, Jesus, each other. They're, they're like, I don't, we don't know what to do. And one of them says, if we say, you can, you can picture them kind of whispering to each other, right? Guys, if we say from heaven, he will say, why did you not believe him? They're in a bind. They're in a bind, church. Because, again, they believe that John the Baptist was a true prophet from heaven. How can they deny the very words that he spoke about Jesus? And it's not going to be behind me, but you can go to it. Go to John 1, 24 through 31, if you would like. John 1, 24 through 31. Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him. They're coming to question John the Baptist, because here he is out in the wilderness and people are coming to him. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. But among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day... He saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. The words... From John the Baptist. The words that would be ringing in the Jews' ears, even though they didn't see Jesus as the biblical Lord and Savior, they believed the words of John. Now back to the scenario of the religious leaders before this crowd, after Jesus has just asked them that question. If they admit that John was a true prophet of God's, then they would have to believe what John said about Jesus, that this is the Messiah standing before them. How can the religious leaders go against the true prophet of God? 
And we know the truth is that the religious leaders don't believe that John the Baptist was a true prophet. But they couldn't say that. Now look at verse 6. Now, they're, they're, they're still whispering, okay, because they're like, okay, but, but if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death. For they are convinced that John was a prophet. Again, John the Baptist was highly respected amongst the Jewish people. But if these religious leaders make the claim that John was just a man and not a prophet of God, ooh, that would not be good. The thousands would come after them. Not only would they come after them, but would also put them in the same place with the charge of blasphemy upon them. So, verse 7. So they answered. Hey, they finally come out, look to the crowd, look to Jesus, look to each other. They finally say, well, just go ahead and say it. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. How humiliating. You can picture them, remember, picture them walking towards Jesus, chest stuck out, proud of themselves, finally got him. And then in one simple question, Jesus destroyed them. What did Jesus do? We need, to, we need to learn from this, church. He humiliated them. Humiliated them in front of everyone. And guess what, church? He does it on purpose. But this isn't the hippie Jesus, Brit. Hippie Jesus wouldn't do that. That's because Jesus wasn't a hippie. He just cleared out the courtyard. Now he's humiliating the proud. And he did it intentionally. The very men who corrupted the word of God, who taught a false gospel, he made them look stupid in front of everyone. We should be following in his footsteps. This is why we as believers... This is why we need to know the word. And this is why, as believers, we are to do the same as Jesus. We call out the false teachers and humiliate them. We are to take them down. Because they twist the word of God. And there is to be no mercy when it comes to exposing false teachers. Well, it just seems so mean to do that. Who cares? Man up. This is exactly what Jesus did. Do you think we should just sit back and let people twist the word of God? Well, I'm not going to say anything because it's just not politically correct. Jesus was not politically correct, church. He doesn't care about that garbage. He speaks the truth. And you know what the truth does? It hurts when you are wrong. Let me ask you, how mean and wicked is it to take the word of God and manipulate it for one's own benefits? You tell me who's being mean. We have Teachers today who change the words or they'll just skip the passages altogether because they don't like what it says. How can they have people keep coming back? How can they continue to line their pockets if they're hurting people's feelings? Church, we as believers are to be like pit bulls when it comes to the word. For those who preach a 
false gospel, we are to latch onto them and tear them to shreds when they take the word and mangle it. This is important. We are to be like that pit bull. Once it tastes blood, it's not going to let go of whatever it attacked until it is no longer breathing. And we, church, we are called to do the same who twist the word of God. You call them out and you expose them. That's how the believer is to be when it comes to defending the truth. Let me give you an example. We are in, well, let's just say it, 2020. What in the world? Thankfully, God is sovereign that he's in control over everything, but we as humans can just say, wow. And I say that because some of the most well-respected theologians and pastors today need to be devoured by the powerful jaws of discernment. You guys know Albert Moeller, president of Southern Theological Seminary? Well, he's allowing critical race theory to be taught at a once-respected seminary. David Platt, we all know David Platt. Well, he just released a book titled, Before You Vote. What do you think that book's about? It's saying that it's okay for Christians to vote for Democrats. J.D. Greer, president of the SBC, is not allowing his church to meet until 2021, but he's encouraging the congregation to go out and protest peacefully with Black Lives Matter. Again, the critical race theory in David Platt's book and the president of the SBC, are telling Christians that it's okay to vote for the Democratic Party. Do I think that you can be a Christian and vote for the Democratic Party? Nope. I think you can be ignorant of what the Democratic Party stands for as a Christian and vote, but if you truly know what they stand for, no way. Democratic Party is anti-God, church. I'll say it again, anti-God. Biden, I know this isn't popular to do from behind the pulpit, but we need to know the truth. We can pretty much kiss our 501c3 goodbye after this too. Biden, but who needs it? Biden this past week said this after being asked, question. How will you, as president, reverse this dangerous and discriminatory agenda and ensure that the lives and rights of LGBTQ people are protected under U.S. law? Biden said, I will flat out change the law. He continued, the idea that an eight-year-old child or ten-year-old child decides, you know, I decided I want to be transgender. That's what I decided I'd like to be. It would make life a lot easier. Let me put that in English for you guys, because Biden struggles with that. What Biden is saying is he thinks it's okay for an 8-year-old or a 10-year-old who is a male say, Mom, Dad, I'm ready to be a female. Let's do this thing. And then Mom and Dad are supposed to say, okay. Little Johnny, you wanted to be a T-Rex last week, but let's go make you a girl today. This is sick. And we have pastors, theologians standing before the church saying, it's okay to vote Biden in. It's okay. He continues, and so I promise you, there is no reason to suggest that there should be any right denied to your daughters or daughters. 
I wrote that down properly. That's what he said. Biden said, asking if there was one or two, because he forgot how many daughters this woman had that asked the question. Biden concluded her transgender daughter should have every right that your other has a right to do. Half the country thinks this is okay. And now we have the church saying that it's okay. It's not okay. It is sick. It is anti-God. And you cannot be a Christian and vote for this nonsense. Any pastor that stands for this needs to be called out. Needs to be called out. And if the church was a true Bible-believing church, they would ask him to step down, but first he must repent. Because there's no way possible that a man of God would stand for this. It's disgusting. We don't need to be cowards. We don't need to worry about hurting other people's feelings. Look, little Johnny, you're a boy. Get over it. That's what you are. We're not going to lop off any of your body parts. We're not going to put you on estrogen. That's crazy. God made you a male. Are you saying that God makes mistakes? The pit bull of discernment should shred every single so-called pastor or so-called theologian that says a Christian can vote for the anti-God party. That's exactly what Jesus did there. Humiliated them in front of thousands. Where's our spawn, church? Verse 8, and Jesus said to them, remember, because they said, well, we don't know. So what does Jesus say? Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. He humiliated the religious elite, and then he tells them he's not going to answer their question. After three years of my ministry, you don't know the answer to this. Three years of miracles that I performed and you don't know the answer to this. There's more than enough evidence put before you to know that I am the Messiah. But no more evidence will be given to those who've rejected him. For the religious leaders, they have God's word, the prophets and the laws. They've all pointed to Christ, and yet here he is standing right before them, fulfilling every prophetic word and upholding the law perfectly, and yet they still reject him. Church, this may be the most terrifying words that ever come from my mouth, but God's patience was gone. They rejected the truth time and time again. And now the truth has been taken from them. They will no longer be able to see the truth. For God has hardened their hearts once and for all. But listen to me, church. This is extremely important. Just as Jesus humiliated the false teachers... Notice what he was first doing. He was preaching the word, the good news. Thousands were listening. That's what he was focused on. Because one must first 
hear the good news. And by way of them hearing the truth, the Holy Spirit comes upon them, regenerates that heart of theirs, and they believe. Now, we don't know when God's patience has ran out for someone. We don't know that time. So what are we to do? Continue taking it to them. That's something else that Jesus did. Let us pray.